it's my job to say something about him. So, uh, before that, I just want to acknowledge our gratitude for his. He has been coming to this meeting, SFR, SFRR meeting. This is the third meeting in the last four years. So, uh, so, so he's a very staunch supporter, uh, participant of this meeting. And he's a faculty professor in the uh, University of Iowa. You know, you heard his lecture on quantitative redox biology the day before yesterday. So, you know, his, uh, you know, which is not lecture, it's teaching, that's his style. He also earned uh, the nickname Master Teacher. If you attended the Society for Theoretical Medicine and Biology, that he has been part of, he was also the president, the last uh, president of the Society. He introduced free radical. Sunrise Free Radical School every, during the conference four days, every morning for, for one and a half hours, so four days, six hours total, he will arrange this education lecture. He himself will present and then we will invite people. Many people I have seen the youngsters, postdocs, the laboratory graduate students who like to go and attend the meeting just for the first morning couple of hours because very, very useful. And he has been doing that successfully for so many years. And that's how you know he earned that nickname, master teacher among that society. But he is also a great, great teacher. I have invited him to speak in our own place, Institute University, many times. So he's going to talk to you about how to write a scientific paper. Again, not just a scientific paper, but how to make make it powerful. Also, listen to his lecture very carefully. It's quite possible, very likely, that you will be, if you submit a paper on redox biology or redox chemistry, it's very likely that he will review a paper. So listen to <laughs> so, so listen to his lecture very carefully. I invite Dr. Good morning. Well, thank you for the kind invitation uh, to give this talk. It's uh, this talk, typically I plan it for an hour, and we have about 20, 25 minutes, so it's going to be a challenge for me. Uh, the title is very carefully chosen. Uh, the title is how I write a scientific paper. Uh, so that, this is my approach, obviously. There's no one path. I'm not telling you how you should do it. I'm telling you how I should do it. You know how I do it. Selling your data with power writing. Um, by that, what I'm trying to, uh, the point I'm trying to make there in that title is I want the data to be understood by the reader, okay? Uh, and so when you sell a product, you know, uh, uh, why, why do you buy something? It's useful. It's going to solve a problem. Your data, we hope it's useful. It's going to help, you know, my data that I'm presenting. I hope it's useful to you, the reader. I hope it helps solve some of your problems. So this connection between sales and paper is right there. The same thing. Okay. I'm hoping your data is useful to the scientific community. So what to expect? Okay. I'm going to provide ideas on how to approach writing. It's not about grammar. Not about grammar. Okay. So what is a paper? Well, it's simply a means to publish data. That's it. Data, that's the heart of the paper. Okay. You do provide a, an interpretation of that data, okay? but that interpretation is not going to be permanently correct, probably. It's going to change with time. So I have a mathematical formula. Interpretation is a function of time, and that is because after you publish your paper, there will be new data coming on board. And people will now look at your data, the new data, and they'll come to a different conclusion. Maybe just a little bit different, or a very different conclusion. But your data are still useful, because the data are correct. Okay? As long as you tell exactly how you collected the data, it's repeatable, the data will not change. So when you think about writing, we all think about uh, creative writing, the novel, the poem, et cetera. Um, and that's very important writing. It you know, stimulates our thinking. It changes society. There's also manuals. Okay, uh, How do you do something? How do you run your uh, VCR? How do you run your cell phone? Uh, that sort of thing. Uh, trying to get things. But <clears throat> another huge class of writing 
is what is called persuasive narrative writing. That is, you're trying to persuade someone to a point of view. This is the editorial in the newspaper, you know, or, or some document from the government saying why we should build a new school, why should we should redo this road. There are reasons, you know, logic or persuading you, the taxpayer, that we should spend your tax money this way or that way. It's the same thing in science. We have our data. And what we want to do is persuade the reader that our interpretation is correct, okay, with the facts we have. So the first thing you have to think about when you're writing is who is the audience. So people write uh, uh, to all different audiences, okay? So when you're writing your paper, think about it. Are you writing to the technical experts? Well, yes, you are. Are you writing to those knowledgeable in the area? Well, that's a very good uh, 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 audience to address. Broader area, all scientists, all readers, where are you? So lots of beginning students write only to the technical experts. That is to their uh, lab bench partner, so to speak, and is unintelligible beyond, so to speak. And so what I try to do when I write a paper is I write to those knowledgeable in the area and try to have a little bit to the even broader area. And it would be great if all scientists could understand what I was writing to. So I have everything there for the technical expert, all the little nitty gritty details somewhere, the methods, figure captions, et cetera. But I try to write the text in a way that it, those knowledgeable in the area and even broader area of scientists can uh, get the gist of what I'm uh, presenting. So you, know, you all know the typical manuscript. There's the title, abstract, introduction, et cetera. So I'm going to go over uh, uh, some of these. But where do you begin? Well, <laughs> since the data are the heart of the paper, that's where you should begin. That's where I begin, with the data. So once you have data being collected, you begin to see the story. Whether the story fits your original hypothesis or not, that's a, you know, don't fall in love with your hypothesis. I love that. Uh, Coops loves that too. Uh, but after you see, and we do this in our lab, after you do so many experiments, you see that, well, yeah, the, uh, you see the hypotheses that we're generating, which ones are correct, and you sort of get the picture. And once we sort of have the picture, we start writing, even before all the experiments are done. So once we start that, 